Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Hall. I'm executive director at Montclair Film and the Montclair Film Festival. Thank you so much for joining us for this converse, conversation with Lee Isaac Chung, our breakthrough director, uh, and his film Minari playing in the festival. Isaac, welcome to the Montclair Film Festival. Thank you so much. Such an honor. <laughs> That's very kind of you. <laughs> I want to start off uh, by talking a little bit about your background. So Minari uh, feels uh, autobiographical in a lot of ways. Um, I may be wrong about that, but it certainly has a personal quality to it uh, in the filmmaking. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your background. Uh, I know that you grew up in Arkansas uh, and that this film sort of speaks to that uh, time and place. Um, how did you uh, become a filmmaker in its sense? How did this all get started for you? And Tell me a little bit about how Minari relates to that. Um, sure. I, so, I, yeah, I did grow up in Arkansas. Um, I, I went to college on the East Coast. And uh, basically, I, I, I was on this trajectory of trying to go to medical school and do, trying to do something very practical with my life. And uh, it, it was in my senior year of college that I started to get into cinema. Growing up in Arkansas, I didn't have too much uh, exposure to different types of films because I grew up on a farm basically in the middle of nowhere. Um, so in college, I had to take this arts requirement class. And once I did that, I started to watch lots of films and I was making experimental films and uh, just fell into it, just just really started to love it. And that's kind of how I, I started on that journey of becoming a filmmaker. Um, and I worked at that for, I, I graduated college in 2001. Um, and I, I worked at, at making films for a while, for many years, uh, most of them independent, uh, kind of art house films, uh, a lot of them slightly experimental. Um, and maybe it was around seven years ago after I made my uh, most previous, most recent film before Minari, I, I just started to feel like I was losing my way with it. Um, and around that time, I, I had a, my wife and I, we had a baby girl and uh, I was spending a lot of my time, you know, basically helping her grow up and um, taking care of her. And at the same time, reassessing like my own work as a filmmaker and what I want to do. Um, and roughly that's how Minati came about. I, I, I started to think more about, um, I don't know, what a film does for audiences, what it can do and, and stories and um, this interaction you have with an audience. Like I, I started to really feel this desire to connect with an audience in a, in, a, in a more emotional way, I guess. Whereas before I was thinking a lot more about the art form and, and um, I don't know, uh, just the art of it all. Um, and I, at the same time, I also wanted to make something that I could leave behind for my daughter uh, with, with this particular film. And I knew I, I, I might not have another chance at this. So um, I decided I'm just gonna pour everything I have into this one film and try to, um, I don't know, kind of tell the story of where I feel I came from in Arkansas and connect that as well to the sort of things that I was observing now as a new father, uh, someone who's trying to pursue a dream in some way. And I, I started to realize that my memories of my father and my mother, um, in some ways I, I could understand them a lot better now that I was a parent. And now that I had gone through a lot of failures of my own and um, you know, li life wasn't so easy as I, I expected to be when I was young. Uh, so, so just looking at all those things, um, I, I kind of poured both, you know, myself and also my family's story into, into one story. Um, so basically it, it comes from, Minari comes from about uh, 80 memories that I jotted down of, of when I was growing up, uh, around the time when I was like five years old to eight years old. Um, and of course, I condensed a lot of these memories into into one year to try to tell this story. Um, so, so that's the basis of the story. And then um, I tried to shape those memories into a narrative that makes sense, um, that that has like a, you know, follows more of a classical structure in a way, um, in which there are basically two love stories that are happening within the film: one between the parents, and then one between the 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 grandson and the grandmother. Um, so, yeah, I. I Having said all that, I, I don't want to say that this is completely autobiographical because I took a lot of creative liberties and, um, you know, had to change a lot of stuff. So, yeah. Were you, were you that precocious when you were a young boy? 
Um, I was really naughty. So, <laughs> yeah, all the things that he does that that you shake your head about, those are probably things that I, I would normally did on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I don't know about precocious, but it's funny. You you look back and you realize a lot of your memories are those things that um, that still trouble you or still stick with you even now. So maybe that lends itself to feeling like you were a precocious kid, but um, you know, you realize some of the emotions we have are quite quite old. They 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 start very young and they last with us. Uh, this is one of, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the first screenplay that you wrote by yourself. You've collaborated in the past on the writing process. Is that true? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, my friend Sam Anderson and I, we, we collaborated on a number of, of scripts together. Um, th this one is probably different in that in previous scripts, we, we like to keep it loose and write a, a basic outline for a story. Uh, we, we would write dialogue and all those things, but on set, we would just give it over in, to improvisation. Um, I think when I made a film called Abigail Harm, that that film was almost entirely improvised. And I, I kind of, something clicked in me where I thought, the next time I do this, I want to write, and I want to, I want to write a script that I can basically say, hey, let's not deviate too much from this. Um, I mean, we we did that with this film as well. We deviated sometimes and we would improvise, but um, I wanted to to know that on paper I have something uh, just because of the stress of of doing an improvised story is really difficult. Yeah, and in your first film, Munyar and Gabo, uh, you went to Rwanda to make that film in the Kinyarwanda language. And I've never been able to ask you if you knew the language and if not, how did that story come about for that film? How has that experience of creating Munyar and Gabo framed your career since and led you to arrive at a piece like Minari? Mm. Yeah, I'm so glad you've seen that film. Uh, that that film, I, I basically did a lot of research before going, and um, I, wa I was never intent on going to Rwanda, but my wife uh, had been doing some volunteer work there as a counselor and a therapist. And uh, she wanted to go back for a summer and she basically asked me to figure out something I could do over there. So um, uh, th there were a number of students who were interested in, in learning how to make a film. So that's kind of where, where that whole project uh, originated. Um, and I, I researched like, I don't know, a story that I thought might be fitting. Um, and it was about a nine page outline that Sam Anderson and I wrote together. Um, and once I got there, basically, I, I spent um, a couple of months teaching how to make films and also interviewing lots of people about their own experiences. Um, and I would just put down all these different experiences and, and try to shape it into a story. In a way, I guess that's related to Minari in that Minari kind of um, tells a story based upon real life experiences, but shaped into, into a narrative. Um, and I, I think another similarity is that um, I mean, I, I think I'm always interested in this idea of relationships that somehow feel doomed or somehow um, there's, there's a, a great amount of pressure that's keeping two people together. And I realized with Minari, I was, I was really treading the same territory. And you, after that, uh, directed Lucky Life, uh, which is a, if, you, if folks haven't seen it, please track it down because it's really quite an interesting a film, uh, in a very independent project. Um, and like you said, a little bit more on the experimental side in terms of a narrative. Um, but from there, you mentioned uh, Abigail Harm. That was the first film in, you know, in my thinking of working with a, a pretty well-known cast. Um, you worked with actors on Lucky Life and you, you know, Abigail Harm, you mentioned it being improvised. You have Amanda Plummer in that movie, I think, if I remember correctly, Burt Young. That's right. Um, really terrific actors in that film. Um, what did you learn as a director about working with actors, starting with this sort of, like you said, film school or teaching young people and teaching this narrative project with Manu and Gabo over time uh, to Minari again? What sort of, what's the process of working with actors been like for you? Um, I, I feel like I'm learning every time, to be honest. Um, so Manu and Gabo and Lucky Life, they, those films, they were non-professional actors and uh, Abigail Harm, um, as you said, you know, I started to work with, um, you know, seasoned vets. And I, I guess what I learned is that every person is different and you just want to set everybody up to succeed. Um, and 
Um, and I, it's, it's such a wonderfully collaborative uh, process that I, I kind of feel like it's like being a maestro in, in, a, in a way, like you, you have your musicians and you really just want to get them to work together um, and, and you don't want to take anything away from them. So um, I don't know, with, with I, I kind of used to think, well, you want to give actors tons of freedom, even with the script that you could say anything you want. Um, but, but I also realized in the process of making Minari that um, they really, uh, there are actors who really enjoy just having these words that they feel are true and then having to embody those words. And that's something that I, I really admired of, of the actors in Minari, that they really took um, the script and dialogue and they figured out a way to make it alive in their own way that I, I could never have expected. Um, so I, I imagine the next film I'll learn a, a lot as well, but each time it just feels like I, I'm trying to go in with an open mind about how to how to work with people and, and figure out how to help them succeed. And another bridge between your first film and, and, and Minari is uh, working with children uh, or young actors. You mentioned non-professionals. Uh, what was the relationship like with, with the kids on set and how did you work with them? They give such authentic performances, deeply felt performances. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, as a father myself, uh, wondering how you would work with the kids to draw them out and get, and get those performances out of them. And what sort of, again, along the way, what you might've picked up as a director of how to do that. Mm. Yeah. So with Alan and uh, Noel, who, who played the two kids in Minari, um, they, they hadn't acted before. So I knew that it would be fun to be able to capture them responding for the first time to something and really capturing truth in a way. So we, I guess that sort of improvisation did happen a lot where uh, we tried to set up the, the scene and situation so that often they're the first ones getting the close up or, or the setup is first favoring them. Um, and, and then just read the situation, read, read how everything happens on their faces. For instance, um, the scene in which uh, David is given the chestnut um, for the first time, um, you know, that's such an honest response that he gives. Uh, I, I, I didn't tell him what was going to happen. And, you know, you just read it on his face how disgusting <laughs> he finds this thing to be. Um, and, and all the other actors who were more seasoned, they were all in on it and they knew, like, we have to draw out these things uh, with these two actors. So, so the casting process was maybe the most important. Uh, we, we just felt with these actors, these young actors, they were so present in any, any scene or any uh, audition that, that we, would, we would do. Um, we had Stephen come in and, and read a bunch of lines with, uh, with Alan and, and do this thing where they would improvise scenes inside of the audition room. And Alan was just always very present with him. So we, we knew that um, there's something beautiful and real that we would capture from his face. Um, at the same time, a secret all-star on our set was Alan's mom. Uh, <laughs> basically, every night in the hotel room, if there were scenes with lots of dialogue, she would kind of drill him to memorize the dialogue. And I was always impressed with just how prepared he was. And, uh, and yeah, I could tell that his mom was working really hard on that. That's terrific. Uh, working with Steven Yun, so he, you know, uh, Everyone will know him from, you know, The Walking Dead in, in the U.S., but recently Burning, which was a tremendous movie uh, that he started. And we actually watched that as part of our sort of COVID film club here at Montclair uh, mm -hmm. Film. Uh, he's, a, he's a terrific actor. Like you said, uh, your cast, aside from the children, are pretty much seasoned pros at this point. How did you attract this cast? How did you find these actors and get them excited and interested about being in this film? Um. Stephen, uh, I, I have to hand it to my, my team at, at CAA who really helped bring him in on, and on board with this. And also Christina O oh at Plan B, uh, when, once she stepped on um, to produce this film. Uh, in a way, it's a small world in which uh, Christina O oh at Plan B knows him. And then Christina Chow, my agent, was, was also part of his team. And, and actually, he's married to my cousin, which is, is really <laughs> So oh, okay. 
but but we'd never talked about work or anything. And and it was kind of the the people at CAA who said, hey, I think this this might be able to work. Uh, and and they played the middlemen or middle people in in this sort of thing. Um, and um, then with the Korean actresses uh, Yoon Yo Jung and Han Yeri, um, basically they were. Uh, I was I'm friends with a Korean producer named Ina Lee, and I was teaching in Korea last year or a couple years ago. And while I was over there, uh, this producer basically got me in ch- touch with these two actresses. Uh, she, the the producer read the script and she said she'd like to help me um, figure out casting for Korea. So I met with um, Yoon Yeo Jung and and Han Ye Ri and we talked over the script and I just knew they were perfect for the part. So uh, that's how I met them. And what was their reaction to the location and sort of this very American story? Uh, you know, it's of immigration and it's a very specific. Um, feeling, you know, not necessarily immigration, but uh, being sort of a fish out of water, I should say, um, in a culture. Um, what was their reaction to that? How did they, did you bring them along to the to the story in, in that regard? Um, for, so it's different for both of them. Yoon Yeo Jung, uh, who plays the grandmother, she's lived in the U.S. before and in the South. Like she, she lived in Florida, I think, in, on the Panhandle. Um, and she remembers her experience then, like she lived there for 10 years. It was kind of a lonely time and uh, not an easy time. So she kind of knew instantly when she read the script, like, oh, I know this story. And she she was there back in the 80s as well. Um, so I think for her, it wasn't that um, much of a, a diff, or it, it wasn't a mental stretch in a way. For Han Yeri, it was a new experience. Uh, Han Yeri, who plays Monica. Um, and... Um, I don't know. She she's just so open to anything that she never let on if if it's weird or anything like that. She always seemed like she's on a big adventure. Um, so so it was fun to see her, you know, going and having barbecue for the first time and all those things as well yeah, in Tulsa. That's great. Uh, one of the other things I love about this film is the the period and how you evoke the period very subtly. It's not a sort of uh, beat you over the head, uh, you know, there's neon everywhere and everyone's going to the mall and listening to Madonna. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very subtle recreation of that period in time that you mentioned, the 80s, um, and even the late 70s. It feels timeless in a way. Can you talk about uh, how you wanted to evoke that time period in the film and sort of how you constructed it on camera? Yeah, we. Uh, so early on, we decided we don't want to go hyper uh, retro nostalgia with the film. Um, Young Ok Lee, who, who's our production designer, uh, she sent me this incredible mood board at the start of the uh, of pre-production um, in which it just looked like my childhood. Um, all the colors and all the little little details that she wants to implement. Um, so her theory on, on the visual look was that we need to invest in the details. Um, so, I mean, she, she had details inside uh, Stephen Yen's wallet, for instance, she had little, uh, you know, the, the credit card that would have been, or, or whatever card would have been in that wallet at that time. You know, she was very uh, painstakingly detailed about that. Um, Locky, who is our DP, um, I mean, he's he's a DP on Stranger Things, so he he knows that <laughs> sort of retro <laughs> look that right. that can be done. Um, but but we we would talk more about how do we create this feeling of a classic Western film, like a classic, you know, uh, big frontier Western, in which you have that big frontier outside, and then on the inside you have this small intimate family uh, drama. So, uh, yeah, the the idea was always to create a mood of something, but not necessarily like, um, I don't know, not like make it uh, kind of in that cheesy like let's let's celebrate the 80s sort of. I, I love that stuff, by the way, but but that just wasn't this film. We thought that'd be distracting for this one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I, I have another question about sort of the genesis of the project. You mentioned, um, you know, shopping the script, or, script around. You had three features under your belt. A lot of people, you know, are familiar with sort of the challenges of getting independent films made. You mentioned becoming a father during that period between films, et cetera. What was the journey like to get the film, you know, produced, not just casting and, and shot, but actually, you know, getting financing and getting everything together so that you could get the film made? Because from just the little 
hints that you've been dropping in the conversation. It seems like it was quite a road. Um, yeah, I, I mean, as you know, the films I've made, they don't they don't really look like. Um, I mean, they're not very commercially driven, and, and they're they're quite experimental. Um, so, with with this film, I knew I wanted to do a classical story, and I, I really invested a lot of time in the script, basically. And I knew that that was the only thing that could really get me anywhere was really sh having a, a good script. Um, I, I knew that my body of work it might go against me because you know people would wonder, okay, so Minadi is going to be this minimalist sort of um, you know <laughs> art house film. Um, so basically, I, I felt like the script just had to be really strong. So I, that's the thing that I really worked on and honed. Uh, before I finally sent it in to a friend of mine who was working at CAA. And she she wasn't representing me at the time. Uh, her name's Christina Chow, uh, but she really believed in it. And she said she'd like to see if we can get anywhere with it. And that was really the start. Once she came on board, um, you know, she she was great about pitching the project around and also conveying like this film that I want to do is a little different from what I've done in the past. and. Um, that that I'm really quite actually quite interested in engaging with a larger audience and trying to take them on this ride. Um, one of my favorite conversations I've had with the filmmakers with Arno de Pachin, who we were talking about post production, and he said he felt a real obligation to honor the performances of the actors in the editing room. And you're talking about sticking to your script in terms of shooting and making room for improvisation and creating authentic moments for the kids to respond to. How did that carry over into the editing room when you put the film together uh, narratively? Um, were you finding, uh, you know, that you were working around what the actors were doing, obviously, but were there things that where you broke away from the script or any sort of surprises in post-production that transformed the movie for you? Um, uh, so Harry Yoon is our editor and, and uh, he, he just did an incredible job, even with the first uh, cut that he made for me to see just a week after we started filming, like we, we both thought, okay, there's a story here. Um, it was it was never about cutting around the actors with this film. And I, I got to say, it's a family drama, so you just have uh, different close-ups of different different people. And sometimes we just feel, oh, we sh I wish we could just see a close-up of this person because what they're doing right now is amazing. Uh, there are moments that we couldn't do that. Uh, so uh, it's more like um, you're, you're just picking from just a bag of amazing amazing things each time. Um, but in terms of, of changing things around, we we did have to. One of the interesting things I, I, I'll have I'll say is that I noticed early on, and Harry, Harry and I noticed that we always have to have David, the the young boy's gaze on everything. Uh, we in the beginning we thought this is just like an objective family story, but but once we start to go away from David. Uh, David's perspective, seeing the story, then the story kind of falls apart. Um, so there's this element of it having to be looked at by this child. We, we have to enter the story through this child's eyes in order for the film to work. Um, so that was kind of a rule for us. And so we took away certain scenes um, that we felt takes us too far away from that, uh, scenes that I really liked. And then also just juggling tone and timing and all that stuff. We We had to reorder some days and all that stuff. But um, otherwise, I mean, we, we edited it rather quickly and um, just had a, had a great time doing it. So a final question for you. Um, this is a very difficult time for everybody, uh, and especially in, you know, film production circles and getting new work made. This movie premiered at Sundance in January. Um, a A24 is going to do a great job with it, as they always do. We're very grateful to them for sharing the film with us for the film festival and for you being here with us. Um, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts about uh, next steps. Has this has Minari sort of changed your approach to your next project? Have you even thought about that at this point? I know this movie is just now getting out into the world, and it can be sort of an obnoxious question to ask, like, what's next? I mean, this is now happening now. But uh, it feels like a very timely moment for people to be thinking about what they're going to do uh, next. And as this movie comes into the world and, you know, is going to receive a lot of attention, I, I believe, um, do you have plans for what you're going to do next with, with your career? And what sort of lessons from this film will you carry forward? That's, that's a good question in terms of the lessons. I, um, 
and, and what's what we're going through now. Uh, I, I think a lot about, um, you know, the, the sorts of films that we're putting out there. And I, I've been watching lots of like old Capra films during this whole, mm. the whole COVID thing and John Ford and, and uh, uh, Billy Wilder. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess for me, like, I, I feel like I'd like to tell some stories that understand and, and wrestle with the necessary cynicism I feel like we have to have, but also try to find a way out of that to, to something that, um, I don't know, gives, gives, gives us some direction in a way of, of what does it mean to be human? And, um, th- th- in, in general, that's what I'm looking for in future projects, uh, something that can really, uh, I don't know, make us feel alive in a way. Um, and at, at the same time, I, I'd love to, you know, create another emotional ride and experience for people as well. Like like I felt uh, Minari, uh, which I hope Minari will do for people. So, um, so I'm not sure. Uh, I, I just hope that it all comes back, all the filmmaking and... <laughs> and um, that everyone will be able to do it safely. But yeah. Every generation needs a Frank Capra. Aim oh, high. Yeah, I, and I won't say that I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, yeah. <laughs> say that I'm no, I don't, I'm not that. saying that you were saying that. I just think it's a great, that is a great reference because, you know, there there is something about that empathetic power of movies to bring people together around an idea or a sense of belonging uh, that is so absent. Um, that's one of the reasons we love doing film festivals is, you know, getting people together. We're doing this virtually now. We're not, we have no idea how it's going to translate for people. Um, but I can absolutely see where you're coming from with that uh, in terms of watching films and, and reconnecting. Uh, last question. I know we're almost out of time. Did you, you mentioned, uh, you know, that transformative moment in college. Uh, and I love hearing about John Ford and Billy Wilder and Frank Capra. What was the film that sort of made you, uh, pivot from uh, a medical career to deciding, you know what, I want to be a filmmaker. I, uh, what what were the movies that did that for you? I'm curious. Um, to be honest, it was all Wong Kar Wai at that time. Uh-huh. That's yeah, awesome. I, I wanted to grow up and just wear sunglasses all the time, which I, I haven't done. <laughs> but, yeah. Happy <laughs> Together. They so cool. Yeah. They are. Yeah. Some, Chungking Express, those are great films. Yeah. yeah if you, if, uh, to our audience, if you haven't seen his uh, Wong Kar Wai's films, go check them out. I highly recommend them all, but I super recommend In the Mood for Love um, if you haven't seen it. Uh, oh, fantastic. Sure. That's great. Well, Isaac, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, thank you for bringing Minari to the festival. Uh, you are our breakthrough director. I really think this film is a uh, a transform a career changer, uh, a transformative movie, and uh, I'm so pleased to be able to bring it to our audiences. So thank you for thank you so uh, all of it, and we're so grateful. We look forward to seeing this movie succeed and continuing to follow your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support.